So, when we started writing the paper, much of my portion should be pretty obvious to the guys here, to, to the people here, right? And if it's not obvious, then I apologize. But I've changed the presentation, my part, from what is the status of Bitcoin, which was the overview part of the technology and product, and changed my presentation to be much more around the opportunity that I, being part of the venture capital community, um, see in Bitcoin. Right. And so if you have procedural questions about Bitcoin and kind of status, uh, we can definitely take that offline later. So, wow, terrible animations. So, we have this. Um, the way that if we look from the finance, if we took kind of a 20,000 feet approach is what's the opportunity of Bitcoin and why do we need to talk about the regulation environment, right? The opportunity, especially for Israel, is in Finance 2.0, which funny enough, if you look five years back, everyone spoke in Israel and turning into the kind of finance center. Uh, but for the first time, at least in the venture capital community, we see that as an actual thing that can happen. And the reason for that, especially in Israel, if you look at the way that finance was in the past, it was very much of a local business, very well protected, and without APIs uh, that allowed cross-culture, right? So Bitcoin, for the first time, an open platform that allows a network effect, right? You see it today, if you look at Bitcoin versus Litecoin versus the other coins. The reason why Bitcoin became interesting from the investor side is that there's a network effect that is inherent in Bitcoin. What you see, there's this desire by everyone here that other people will use Bitcoin by itself, which is obvious, but it also protects when we discussed why is Bitcoin, why would this be the only instrument? Why shouldn't we be talking about Litecoins or others? Is because of the network effect. And we actually in the position paper tried, or in a thought paper tried to define how should the government look at this? Because nobody will do regulations around Bitcoin by itself, but the network impact that Bitcoin has will allow us to say significant economic, what's the proper term? The proper term that we found instead of uh, approaching Bitcoin as a single name, you'll approach it in, in your part, so. Thank you. So, why is, this, why is the opportunity? How do we present it? Right. It's, if you look at the two kind of junction points, the first one is Bitcoin as a financial instrument. Right? And that's why everyone here would want, and it's not a fact right now, would want it to be a currency versus an asset. And there, the opportunity, just taking one, the remittance aspect of it, the $550 billion a year industry, that's one very specific aspect, right? But when we are searching for something that Bitcoin can replace, the most obvious one is the area of money, right, as a currency. So $550 billion is $50 billion or so in remittance, just the overall cost, just in transaction fees. And there, had it been defined as a currency or had there be a primary business around that, the overall impact for Israel budget is about the, the entire budget of the Ministry of Education in a single year. So when mapping as a size of opportunity, just combining these, you're talking about something that in a very, very optimistic scenario could be equal on the tax side to the GDP of Israel for a single year. So coming from the side of the investors, that's part of the reason why it was pretty interesting. And today, if you look at payment processors, MasterCard by themselves and the top, top levels of MasterCard are looking how would this impact and whether they should change the underlying layer uh, to use Bitcoin as a transaction layer for that. If you compare that to Israel, checkpoint revenue is 1.4 billion, market cap 12.3. And we should also speak about the non-currency. Our paper did not speak about non-currency aspect of Bitcoin at all. Right? It was only around the currency aspects of it. So the basics, this is in the paper. Should be pretty obvious to most people here. Distributed decentralized ledger. Funny enough, especially when you talk to the ITA, for example, the Israel Tax Authority, um, they view it as something that can be used in order not to pay taxes, in order to avoid taxes. It's quite interesting when you talk to them to say you can actually track, if you had a wallet 
on a pair company basis, you could actually track the PNL on an ongoing basis, right? Because it's an open ledger. And that made all the difference in discussing it, for example, in the ATA in the ITA. The uh, community in Israel, uh, you see it here, uh, but in the US, when you speak to them, when you speak and talk about the Bitcoin community in Israel, the numbers are quite surprising. And when they look at the paper and try to understand what's the impact, what Israel can take from it, you actually see pretty interesting numbers, just in the number of entrepreneurs working on this in Israel versus uh, the US. Especially also when you talk about the Bitcoin 2.0 community and challenges. Uh, would anyone guess in the Q&A what is the biggest challenge when talking about the paper with, uh, especially in think tanks? I'd love to hear your questions about the challenges from, these, from this specific list. So what, in the paper, we talk about the opportunities, and the opportunities we divide into two parts, right? There's the obvious opportunity, there's already exists the wallets, aspect, the mining, Spandulas is here, that's obvious. Money remittance people are already working on and payment processing systems. So this is kind of the opportunity side that we present versus the challenges in the paper itself. We don't talk much about the non-currency aspects, as I mentioned, uh, block, uh, blockchain-based asset registration, IPOs. We almost don't talk about that in the paper itself. And so the most important point in my, at least in, in my section as I perceive it, is what's called regulation arbitrage. And that will be, when we distribute the paper, that will be the portion. Arbitrage in general is the only reason for governments to take Bitcoin and put regulations into place and regulations that would be, uh, that would have an advantage for companies registering in Israel versus registering outside of Israel, right? So Germany obviously has already private money regulations in, in place, but our push in the paper is saying the country that will define regulations in the most favorable terms to companies will be the country where companies register, right? Because you can choose pretty much anywhere that you want to register. And that will be the only driver that will get countries and governments and central banks to take an approach that they should have better regulations than other countries. So if you look at the panel about challenges uh, that was uh, just uh, an hour ago, people actually claimed that a government would not allow uh, losing the sovereignty of registering money by defining it as a form of money. I actually believe the other way around completely. By having an advantage for a country to have better regulations for Bitcoin, it can actually drive many companies to register in that specific country. Right? So if you look at the paper, the first part, talking very much about Bitcoin, the opportunities, challenges, uh, but also the regulation arbitrage. For the second part, I want to invite Akiva. Okay, thanks, Eden. So, um, Eden basically reviews the, the, some of the issues in the current status of Bitcoin, and uh, I try to address a little bit about these issues in in, in the panel that that, that uh, Eden talked about uh, about an hour ago. Uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about what's in the, what my section of the paper, uh, which is sort of really different, uh, but it's, it's what uh, I find especially interesting and uh, uh, has very little relevance to, to, to today's situation, but, but is likely to happen more quickly than at least some of us think. Uh, and that is what happened, what's the world gonna look like when virtual currencies are systemically important, when they're up there with uh, dollars and euros and, and uh, yuans as, as currencies that are used generally as money by uh, people around the world in various types of transactions. Okay? So I'll talk a little bit about monetary economics. What am I supposed? Uh, about monetary economics and I'll talk about uh, where Bitcoin uh, may, may come in or where I think it, it, it ought to come in. Uh, when, when it really happens. Um, so let's talk a little bit about monetary economics since the global financial crisis. Uh, before the global financial crisis, and yes, uh, there was a prehistory before the global financial crisis, uh, monetary economics was largely neglected. There was a period called the Great Moderation where most economies in the world were growing reasonably well, except more probably Japan. 
Uh, inflation was low. Everything seemed uh, was sort of like the end of uh, business cycle history. Uh, and models were developed, which are now the standard models in basically all uh, central banks, all, all West, you know, modern central banks, and certainly in all inflation, inflation targeting, specifically inflation targeting countries, where essentially money didn't appear at all. Money in the financial system didn't appear in the models and were, were, were uh, relegated to a very low uh, share of the thinking about, about uh, macroeconomic issues. It wasn't that people thought that, 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 that uh, they, they didn't have a function, that money, of course, money was there. We used it every day. We bought newspapers, and, and some of us bought cigarettes, not me, but uh, and so with, with currency and, and made payments and with, with credit cards and with checks and, and that kind of thing. But everyone thought that, like, you know, like the plumbing in your house, you know, it's there and it works as long as there's no leaks. Who has to worry about the plumbing and the wiring? People want to worry about, you know, what the stained glass windows look like and the pictures and the, and the walls and, and the wood paneling. And, and, uh, and the models were, were like that in the sense that they, they, they try to bring in all the bells and whistles of, economic, of microeconomic theory into macroeconomic models. And basically that, that required neglecting the monetary and financial system. Uh, and, and those academic and modeling concepts filtered down to monetary policy. Now, since the global financial crisis, the, the profession has been shocked uh, into realizing that, that that was probably a mistake. And we're working very feverishly to try to bring back the notions of, of, of money. And what I, what I uh, term what's called fear of inflation. There was a famous uh, academic paper called Fear of Floating about 12 years ago about floating exchange rates. So I used that caption to call fear of inflation, that the concern that price stability, as it was in the Great Moderation, will not continue. But the disruption could go either way. The, the, before inflation, you could have D, like we seems to be having now, maybe in some countries, or you could have in. And people thought that that you know if, if the uh, if the uh, uh, the present economic situation, real economic situation, continues to be bad, demand low, we might enter a period of deflation. Uh, on the other hand, the feeling was that that what's, what, what what was called in, in monetary po policy circles uh, ultra easy monetary policy, following the the. The, uh, the financial crisis might generate a burst of inflation. So the, the, the idea is that, that uh, it, it, we're not sure which way the inflation will go, but it's not going to be zero. It's not going to be price stability or, or, or very low inflation. Uh, that, that, that life isn't going to be like it was between uh, the early 1980s and, and uh, mid-1980s and the mid-2000s. So here, uh, I'll mention a couple of issues that have, that have come up and, 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 and we might be able to relate to, to Bitcoin. So the, the, the key concept that I want to talk about is what's called the Chicago Plan or 100% reserves, which is an idea that was, that was generated or that, was, that came up, come up with at least uh, in the literature during the Great Depression. Um, uh, well, the, the notion that you could fully separate the monetary mechanism, the monetary aspects of the financial system from other forms of credit associated with uh, economists from Chicago, Henry Simons then, and, and John Cochran more, more recently. Now, the Chicago plan is based on the view that the banks and the financial system are to blame for financial crises because we have fractional reserve uh, banking where banks take sort of hard government money and, 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 and lend, lend, lend it out. They create new money at, 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 at the, stroke of a, the stroke of a pen, uh, and, and they, they, they extend credit, mortgages, business credit for investment, for, for working capital, um, just by writing uh, amounts in, in, in the borrower's uh, demand deposit, and then he goes and spends the money. He or she goes and spends the money. Uh, and and uh, that, that, of course, that, that, that credit is very, is, is very risky and puts the monetary payment and payment system at risk. And the, the ideas were somehow to try to separate the two, that there's, now, now monetary, um, the monetary aspects are also credit. Anytime someone uh, gives up something of inherent value, like his labor or some good or service, and, uh, and receives something that's inherently not valuable, like a piece of paper with a picture of Chernochovsky on it, uh, that's extending credit. In some, in so, okay, so the, so the monetary system is inherently credit, 
The question is to separate the monetary types of credit from all the other types of credit, the pension system and the savings from my trip to the Seychelles Islands and whatever it happens to be, wherever, uh, okay. Uh, and the question is whether, whether that is technologically and institutionally feasible, and so far it hasn't been. Okay, now this is, this is a plan that had the support of many prominent academic economists. For example, two very famous um, academic economists of a previous generation, I don't know to what extent people heard of them, I'm sure pretty much probably, probably everyone heard of Milton Friedman, a famous monetarist, there was also an equally famous Keynesian, James Tobin. Many, they all disagreed pretty much on the basic principles of microeconomics, demand curves slope, slope downwards, and macroeconomics, they disagreed about almost everything as far as I know, they agreed on two things. One, that government should issue index bonds, and B, that the monetary system should have 100% reserve. So the Chicago plan was agreed on also by the Yaleys of, of uh, the Keynesian Yaleys. Um, so basically, that, that notion is that it's the financial system that's to blame for financial mega crises. There's an alternative theory called the fiscal theory of the price level that basically blames lack of fiscal dis discipline inevitably leading to inflation and, and, and the government's ability to control the money supply, or implicitly at least, uh, is the main problem. And the question that I, that I wanted to, to, to ask was, can some kind of monetary invention, innovation, in this case digital currencies, alleviate these monetary problems? Or is this, it, could, could this be a vehicle for uh, bringing in the type of Chicago plan that, that, that provides a lot more security to the monetary system than we have under current systems. So think now about Bitcoin as an independent money, as a s systemically important uh, virtual currency. So then I, I'd like to, like to divide the conditions into what I call necessary and sufficient conditions. So the necessary conditions are basically solving all of the challenges we talked about in the, plan, in the, in the panel, all of the issues that, um, the outstanding technological can, can the, the, the system support uh, massive use, can it be reliable, can, it, is, is it, can uh, illicit uses be avoided or prevented, and that kind of stuff. So all those things have to be solved before uh, Bitcoin or other virtual currencies can become systemically important. Otherwise, the public, the public just won't use them if, uh, if, they're not, if, if these conditions aren't solved. But then the question becomes, what are the sufficient conditions uh, and, and that, uh, given that the necessary conditions are, are uh, hold, that, that all of the, the current and, 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 and unforeseen technical and, uh, and legal and other types of, of, of problems are solved, what are the sufficient macroeconomic issues that have to be resolved in order to be able to, for, for virtual currencies to be a viable currency? This is discussed in some of the literature. Uh, for example, the European Union paper on, on virtual currencies and an I, a couple of IMF papers. The key issue, one key issue is the determination of the issuance. How's, how is the amount of uh, the virtual currency going to be determined? Uh, I guess in two respects. One is uh, what's going to happen with the, with the 21 million bitcoins. In, in, in bitcoin, there's, first of all, there's an answer which is that, that that's a start, that there's some answers to the question, that ultimately there's going to be a fixed amount of, uh, of bitcoins that could be divisible uh, as much as, as wanted. Uh, the question is whether that's uh, a reasonable uh, solution to the problem. People like myself who believe, that, and, and, and the, the, the uh, people who I've talked to in the, in the bitcoin industry fully understand, they're computer experts, mathematicians, they, they fully understand that this implies that as the economies grow, there's going to be deflation. And you say, so what? That's not, a, that's not a big problem. People can understand that. Human history suggests that people can't understand that. There, there's, there's what's called downward price and wage rigidity. People do not like to see their, the money that they're getting, the prices that they're getting falling for some reason, which even if somebody in, some, in, 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 the, in somebody's brain he understands that the price ought to be falling, in his gut he'll feel it shouldn't be my price, it should be somebody else's price or something. Anyway, there's a problem with downward, rage, with, uh, uh, downward price and wage rigidity. If that would be cured in human nature, then I don't see any problem with a fixed amount of bitcoins. My gut feeling is that it's going to take a lot longer to, to solve this aspect of human nature than it's, going to top, than it's going to take to solve the technical problems with Bitcoin. So the, the issue, so, so then if, if, if the 21 million isn't uh, the, the right answer, the question is what is? I don't have uh, a good answer for that. Um, 
is it, uh, is, is it going to be some arbitrary mechanism like a fixed number or voting in, in American Idol? Is it, is it the, uh, the, uh, the minors who are going to decide by some kind of uh, political uh, uh, democratic system? Is that good? Is that bad? I, I really don't know. The other issue is what about the proliferation of virtual currencies? Uh, one of my colleagues uh, was working on, on these issues in, in, this, in the United States says there are now 500, approximately 500 uh, different virtual currencies or competitors with Bitcoin. The, the total amount, he sent me uh, uh, some estimates where Bitcoin is 10 times the size of, all of uh, in terms of market valuation uh, of the next 99 combined. So, uh, so in that sense, Bitcoin is by far and away the biggest uh, virtual currency, but it's certainly not the only one. And so there are issues about, about, uh, about generating substitutes. And in fact, the issue of preventing substitutes has been the Achilles heel in any attempt to think about implementing the Chicago plan. Uh, the question is whether the, the system can be designed to prevent somebody from creating uh, you know, substitutes for, for money that'll have fractional reserves, even if the, 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 the true monetary base kind of Bitcoin virtual currency uh, will be 100% fractional reserves. Uh, so the, the question is whether the network can be designed to prevent the emergence of substitutes in payments, whatever that means exactly, what's, what's exactly payments as opposed to giving out a mortgage. Uh, so there are a lot of conceptual issues that have to be resolved, and of course, uh, is institutional technical aspects, but somehow my, my gut feeling at this stage, is not, it's no more than a gut feeling, that the development of virtual currencies represents an opportunity to think about implementing a truly safe money more, more than any other development that I've seen, at least in uh, the, four, the 35 years that I've been in the business. Uh, one big issue of, of fiscal condition is, is crisis management. Who's going to be responsible uh, in the case of a crisis, even though the, the odds of a crisis may be mitigated in, uh, with virtual currencies? It couldn't, I doubt it will be eliminated. Um, so, my concluding remark, which in some ways maybe I should have started with, uh, the first project I worked on in my career was, uh, was uh, a notion of weighted monetary aggregates where you weighted amounts, it took, took the standard monetary aggregates, M1, M2, and weighted the components by interest rate differentials. Won't go into the details, but we, pub we, we sent a paper to the American Economic Review, and the editor, who was a famous monetary economist, wrote back a week later by snail mail. Okay? Uh, inter you know, internet didn't exist at the time, and everything was done by snail mail. We get a letter all, a week later saying, the, the paper sounded interesting, I read it myself, we need another monetary aggregate, like a hole in the head, the paper's rejected. We, we, we subsequently got it published in a better journal. Uh, the, the, the question today uh, continues, do we really need another money? In addition to all the national monies that we have, my own feeling is there's got to be some kind of product differentiation that makes it special. Maybe implementing the Chicago plan uh, will be some kind of angle in which virtual currencies can make a major improvement to the management of the monetary system. Thanks.